So we're discussing the power of purpose. That's what I want to talk about. But I also want to talk about what is the purpose of power? I had to give a catchy title for this talk. So I wrote down a journey from poverty to power. But actually, I really challenge the word poverty. Most of us use it and don't know what it means, don't know what it feels like, tastes like, looks like. And most of us like to use the word power and we don't really understand what that means either. I know that mainly because we only ever speak about it generally as a good thing, something we want, or we're really, really far away from it. Therefore, we feel the, the opposite end of power dynamics in our society today. I want to tell you about three people who have changed my life and really know their purpose and know their power. And I want to make one confession as well. This is me as a wee boy. I come from a small village called Scotland. Uh, I know you didn't guess by looking at me. Um, and believe it or not, this is me as a young 10 year old or something in my nice uh, The Rock WWF hat, which was trendy at the time, uh, in one of the local youth clubs. And I come from the capital of said village. I come from Edinburgh. Now, many of you will know Edinburgh for the world famous festival. You'll know it being the hotbed of Scottish politics. You might know it as the nice castle in front of the shortbread tins or where that lovely whiskey comes from. I'm not from the place that you see in the shortbread tins. I'm not from the place where the tourists flock to for the festival. I'm not from the lovely esplanades stemming off Edinburgh Castle. I'm from a part of the city that too many people don't like to talk about, that like to pretend doesn't exist. Or you'd sooner hear about it in, in a rebus book or see it portrayed on train spotting. I come from North Edinburgh, down by the waterfront. And this is a community that is known for all the wrong reasons, sadly. These are my childhood homes growing up. If you look at the top left, that's the tenement building I was born in. Then we moved to the house in the top right, which is now air because it has been demolished in the name of urban regeneration. Bottom left behind the smoke there is uh, the tenement I moved to when I left home to, to go and live with my grandparents. And then the last home I lived in in Edinburgh was the bottom right, which has now been demolished as well. And the reason I show this is so you know where I'm starting from, because I guess who I, who I am as a professional, as a speaker, as someone who wants to do something, is based very much on the parts of our lives that too often we don't think matters or we don't like to talk about. And that's where I guess my story starts. The first of three it was on these streets where I grew up, where again, we're written off by the mainstream media as a council sink estate. It's full of benefit scroungers. Young people are all troublemakers. They're all the same, where there's no real hope or aspiration. Um, and we're kind of generalized as some troublesome area that needs to be managed, controlled, or ignored. And I met a young guy who lived in the same street as me, who was 12, and I knew he was having a very hard time. And I was around his house one day, and I seen that he had a diary, he had a journal. And he let me have a wee look at it. And I want to read to you a direct extract from this 12-year-old boy's diary and what he used to write to himself. I really hate my life. Sometimes I wish I was dead. This place is horrible. The drugs, the police, the idiots. Only two nights ago, another teenage boy was stabbed. I hope he's okay. I never see my dad. Good. The way he is after taking all those drugs is horrible. I wish I had a normal family. Mum just sits at home all day depressed. She has no money 
or support from anyone. We went without electricity again for the weekend. The dampness and mould in my room is making me ill and I hate going outside. When I go to sleep, I sometimes don't ever want to wake up again. I feel so trapped. I have nothing to be positive for. No one cares. My life will never ever change. I was a young boy in our country, not even a teenager yet, who had given up for no other reason than where he was from, who clearly lived in a society that was defined by their challenges and not by their qualities. And it's still true right now that we have over one in four young people growing up in poverty. It's still true now that one in 10 of our young people and children are facing a diagnosed or undiagnosed mental health condition. It's still true right now that we have communities that are written off because of the socio-economic challenges they face. These are not people that run politics or run businesses or control the media. We are having our identities and our narratives written by people who don't understand us. And I remember reading this letter and thinking, something has to be done here. And I was no maverick, I was no young prodigy. I was having trouble at school. I didn't really enjoy it. I was hanging around with the wrong crowd. I was in a gang, kind of doing stuff I shouldn't be doing, smoking things I shouldn't be smoking, having a general tough time, just a normal kind of guy getting around in the area. And suffering my own challenges as well both in the streets and, and at school, but also at home. It's one thing to be bullied out in the streets and to struggle with others and to face all these issues, but it's quite another thing to have the same challenges in the, what should be the safety net of home, to have challenges with family that is destabilizing your upbringing. And at the time, I didn't think about it like that. I just remember thinking, young people are getting called troublemakers and hoodies and gangs, and out causing trouble, and offer nothing positive. And for me, that wasn't okay. Politicians on the TV would denigrate my parents and my community because we weren't working, or we're all benefit scroungers, and we're out to make a quick buck, and we don't really care about society. And for me, that wasn't okay. And business leaders didn't connect with my reality either. And I remember, for some reason, thinking at the time, the best people to speak about poverty is people living in poverty. The best people to speak about youth are young people ourselves. It was people like us that have to challenge the traditional power holders in societies. Otherwise, the same things will keep on happening. So very young, my purpose was to be a voice for other young people. Not to be some solo maverick, but to organize people, to mobilize. People think empowerment has to be given. People think politicians have to give us space. People think businesses have to let us in. In almost every real social movement of change, power is taken and not given. And the way I took power is to raise my voice. Sure, I was doing it wrong at the start. I was angry. I had a chip on my shoulder, a bag of chips on my shoulder. And that's not a big man Scottish diet joke. <laughs> but it happens to also be true. Um, and I thought, I'm told too often that I'm from the rubbish family that people kind of know about for the wrong reasons. That I live in the wrong postcode. So I'm never really expected to do that well. That the school I go to is struggling on all the league tables apart from free school meals where we get the gold medal every year. I'm kind of being written off because of where I'm from. And I remember thinking, I'm not going to let my postcode be my destiny. Surely in this country, one of the richest countries in the world, we should be able as young people to define ourselves on what we want to achieve and not where we happen to have been born. So my purpose was to inspire other young people like me. And the hardest thing to do is to have hope. For me, I learned that hope, by definition, is believing that tomorrow can be bright 
when every day up to now has been dark. No matter how dark that room is, no matter how big that room is, there's a switch somewhere that can switch on the light. And for me, fighting against injustice and making other young people who have always been written off believe in themselves was that fight, was that struggle, was that challenge. And I realized I would rather fail trying than fail to ever try. We always think we have great ideas to do stuff, but we never do it because it's not expected of us. There's this kind of tall poppy syndrome that we suffer from. I can't put my head above the parapet. I won't go first. I'm afraid of looking daft, especially for young people. Many of you watching this will be at school or at college. And the last thing you want to do is stand out. The last thing you want to do is make a fool of yourself because we worry about what other people think of us. I want to say to children and young people, especially from poor backgrounds, but everywhere, the most important person's opinion you need to worry about is how you think about yourself. If you define yourself by the judgment of others, you will live forever failing to realize your true potential and beauty. And I started to get involved running campaigns, getting young people mobilized to make a difference. But it's hard. My personal life got in the way. I had to leave home at 14. I had to then apply to try and get a council house and declare myself homeless before I was 16. I couldn't be in my family unit. I'd never seen my mum or dad ever have a job, not once. I didn't have a template for economic growth in life. I didn't know what a standard living uh, was going to look like. But I knew I cared about this stuff, about drugs, about inequality, about broken families, about challenging the stereotypes of poor people. And I got to get involved with a local youth group and to my amazement got to go to Malawi in Africa, one of the poorest countries on earth. And I went thinking the world was against me. I went thinking I felt sorry for myself. I went feeling angry at others. And I met a young guy called Frederick, and this is my second story. Frederick was about the same age as me. The difference being when we were chatting, and we were chatting at the beginning about Arsenal Football Club, and we were chatting about what we had for breakfast, and we were chatting about all the standard stuff. And he dropped into conversation, like he was telling me he, the time. He told me that both his parents were dead at the hands of HIV, AIDS, and malaria, like too many young people in this world today, preventable deaths. And that he lived under a bridge and a pipe for a chunk of his life. He didn't get the education that I, even I took for granted. He didn't have that love and support. And he was living in a community with no social infrastructure. And I was in tears, I was listening. It was putting my life into massive context. I was learning so much through listening. And they said, but it's okay, because I have plans, I have a purpose, I have ideas. And he said, I'm going to run an orphanage and give food, love and education to young people without parents in my country, because I never had it and I know what impact that made. So I'm going to stop that happening to others. Frederick now runs an orphanage in Malawi. And I remember saying to him, how on earth did you do this? You know, I thought I was quite a radical thinker, challenging power structures, and I found myself saying, where did you get the long-term funding strategy from? <laughs> How did you uh, rigorously risk assess this uh, process? Do you all have your uh, disclosure forms and CRB checks? And, and he's like, oh, John, the world thinks about things in black and white, yes and no, can and can't, absolutisms. It's one of the most misguided paradigms of thought. I stopped thinking in black and white and I dream in full colour. I dream in full colour. Now that means nothing. Dream in colour? What are you talking about? Got a grip? <laughs> but see when he's in the room with you and he's leaning forward and his big bright white eyes and his hands are going and he's looking at you like no one ha ever has before. You believe him. The passion is infectious. And I realized then, my first lesson is change and success is about attitude, not about the conditions you're given. 
It's easy for us to find reasons not to do something, to feel sorry for ourselves, to play the victim, to give up, to question fate, to hate God, to hate family, to stop trying, to stop developing. That's the easy route. But I started to learn that you sometimes, in the darkest days, have to find the brightest rainbows to help you keep going. I think it was Winston Churchill who said, when you're going through hell, keep going. <laughs> and when I got home, this really inspired me to want to keep going. So I hit the ground running. I wasn't going to be the poor boy anymore from the dysfunctional family or poor area. I wasn't going to be written off as the, the guy that went to the, the dodgy school. I started to think about university. I started to think about mixing with people from different areas. I wanted to challenge politicians, but I realized that I couldn't just be angry. I had to be smart. Arm yourself with knowledge. Arm yourself with passion. That can't be wrestled with if you're authentic and genuine. And it's easy to get involved in these things and run campaigns and meet politicians and travel the world like I've been so lucky to do since then. And you kind of forget where you come from. You stop smelling the same oxygen for why you started. And I've been lucky to meet and work with amazing people, to campaign on TV, to work in over 20 countries around the world, to meet world leaders like the Queen and Barack Obama and Kofi Annan and, and others. And I speak to them like I speak to them young people in the community centre when I was 12 years old running a wee campaign against racism or when I got a group of boys together to promote women's rights or when I started to challenge hate crimes. And isn't it a bit weird now that we talk about being a progressive society here in this country? But who are the people we like to condemn in the media right now? Immigrants all of a sudden are the problems uh, and then they're causing all the issues we face. All of a sudden we're seeing that everyone on benefits is scroungers and that's why the economy is broken. All of a sudden um, this middle class white thinking says that women are already equal and that there's no racism in modern society and that children have had it better than ever. Sorry, I just don't buy it. Racism's rife. Women still have to play second fiddle to men. We still don't treat people openly in a way that we should. Tolerance is something we need to promote. And I say this to powerful people who are traditional power holders. In the top left-hand corner, that's me meeting Her Majesty the Queen. She's the one in the dress. I'm the six foot three ginger Scotsman. <laughs> Actually, the bottom two is uh, the prime ministers of Nigeria and South Africa. I was elected by the Commonwealth Network as the African spokesperson for youth. Yes, I said African spokesperson for youth. <laughs> so I turned up, of course, in my kilt. Uh, six foot three. Good morning, Your Majesty, uh, Your Excellency. Thank you for joining us for breakfast to change the world together. Well, I was happy, and they went, well, okay, fair play, I'll let you go. Um, but I was elected by young Africans to that position, and the irony of a British white man being elected to that position is not lost on me, and something I'm immensely proud of. But since then, running campaigns around Africa and other countries to put young people in the centre of decision-making. Our generation are not second-class citizens. We're not leaders to be. We're not future adults. We need to have a voice now. And my third story is about a dear friend of mine, probably my only hero, Taufik Ben Saud. Taufik was an 18-year-old democracy peace campaigner, teenager, who was assassinated just over a month ago in Benghazi. Ambushed in his car with his 16-year-old friend Sammy and shot by extremists because peace and democracy and freedom and civil society and young people having power was a threat to them and their evil ideals. He's the guy that would turn up full of energy, laughing, making daft jokes, smiling. He's the 14 year old who was training 25 year olds. He was the one that could cut through all the rubbish, all the BS, all the noise of the media and politicians and get to the point. He genuinely believed in peace and democracy and acceptance. An amazing example, a very reflective example of a young Muslim teenager. 
And I want to say, again, as the third person who's helped inspire me to change my life, I want to say thank you to Taufik. My friend, they can shoot a body, but they can never shoot what you embodied. And I'm standing here now and I'll continue to speak at events and campaign and work with hundreds of others who know and care about you to make sure that young people get put in driver's seat for change. We say no to conflict. We say no to unrest. We say no to lazy power holders that are not democratic because you guys as adult power holders, it's time you start to live up to the expectations of this generation. You're powerful and you can make change. You just need to take the opportunity and act. Taufik's words. So what does this teach us? For me, I've learned in my life, you're confined only by the walls you put up for yourself. We talk about aptitude, the game changer's attitude. We talk ourselves out of the majority of greatness we have. We need to learn to control how we think, find that positive anchor, believe in ourselves, surround ourselves with great people and be willing to get out there and give a go. We have to pursue our purpose. It can be big, it can be small. We all have a purpose. We have many purposes. Be willing to do it boldly and differently and be willing to go first. I'm the guy that kind of believes I don't care how much you know until I know how much you care. Fail. I'm a very successful failure. <laughs> I said, I remember saying it when I was 15 and people were saying, who the hell are you to think you can change something? I have that imposter syndrome. I don't know if you ever get it when your things are going well. I feel like, who am I to be here? It's kind of happening now. I'd rather fail trying than fail to ever try. Oprah Winfrey got sacked from a small local TV company for not being TV-genic. Huh. Remember the time Walt Disney was made redundant by a newspaper for, and I quote, a lack of imagination? <laughs> Steve Jobs got sacked from Apple. How did you get sacked from a company you set up? That's beyond my knowledge. We are all amazingly powerful in our own way. They think power is top down. They think it's linear. It's not. Power is when you choose to tap in to your talents and passion and connect it and do something. Inaction is never an answer. It never changes anything. For me, I said I wanted to tell you what I thought the purpose of power is. The purpose of power for me is to give it away, share it, empower others. The problem with formal modern structures is when we get power, we want to keep it. We pull the ladder up behind us. Change, success, equality will come and we give away power. And I promised you a confession. My confession is the boy in the diary. That was me. And the difference between trying to take my own life at 12 years old and giving up and defining myself by the, the negativities that everyone else bestowed upon me is attitude. To believe in my own dreams. To give away power. To challenge formal structures. To think, why not? It's not okay. So the power of purpose in my life has been absolutely pivotal because that purpose for positive change is not only changed my life, but it's helping me help other people change theirs. And if you buy the argument that attitude is the basis for leadership, is what's beautiful is every single one of us can choose to lead in our own way and realize that we are all very, very powerful. Thank you, guys.